Hello and welcome to Hard Copy. I am Terry Ikumi. On Tuesday this week, the Senate passed a bill which they hope will prevent, prohibit and redress sexual harassment in Nigeria's tertiary institutions. The bill got wide sponsorship from members of the Senate, 106 of them, led by the Deputy President of the Senate, Ovi Omagigi. This was after it had suffered a setback in the 8th Assembly. Now, the House of Representatives on its part is asking for establishment of a special court to try rape cases. The lawmakers believe it will aid the speedy dispensation of justice for victims of sexual crimes across the country. Now, in recent months, many violent crimes which are sexual and gender-based have come to the fore, necessitating the federal government to, de to declare a state of emergency on the matter. However, in real terms, what hope does this give to the victims who have to live through the horrors inflicted on their person? And what does this also mean to advocates and activists who have been on the forefront pushing for these matters to be prioritized and receive the deserved attention? Well, tonight on Hard Copy, we're speaking with an activist and an advocate, Dorothy Njemanze. She is no stranger to the world of sexual violence and rape. However, she now draws strength from there to help others find succor and reprieve in their time of need through her foundation. Dorothy, welcome to Hard Copy. Thank you for having me on. I think it's quite worrisome that the last time you were here, we had this conversation and here we are again on the same subject matter. But some would say that it seems like we've made progress, especially because of the federal government's declaration of a state of emergency on the subject matter. Do you think that we've made uh, that kind of progress from your perspective as an activist and uh, advocate? Well, um, a, declaration of, a declaration of the state of emergency on gender-based violence is one thing, and then action to ensure that it's not just talk, but it's actually walking the talk, is another thing. For the uh, declaration of the state of emergency on gender-based violence, especially done by the um, Nigeria Governors Forum, to be effective, we need to see that the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act, the Child's Rights Act, the Disability Rights uh, um, Act are uh, not only domesticated in all states of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, but the executive in all the states have clearly defined means of funding, um, you know, processes related to um, implementing these laws. We need to ensure that independence of the police exist in all the states of the Federal Republic of Nigeria so that the burden of the cost of justice is not on the victims who many times do not have the uh, resources or the funding. We need to ensure that medical services are free. Ekiti State has taken the lead. What, is, what are other states doing? Ekiti State has at least started with minors. That's somewhere to start from. What are other states doing? It's not about, um, we're tired of the pop and pageantry, we're tired of the hashtags, we're tired of the protest. We want to see real-time things that impact on the lives of people. And we are not um, oblivious of the fact that these things are supposed to be done by people who we have handed public offices to entrust using the elections. And luckily for us, 2023 is by the corner. So we're engaging everybody to ensure that everybody is useful and to teach people that people who are not useful to us in the political field, make, they don't come anywhere near any trusted position of office, you know, come 2023. Well, just before we go into the details of the sexual harassment bill that's passed by the Senate, you've talked about the need for governments to step up and take action. You commended Equity State uh, for the measures it's taken. And the issue of domestication of those laws, some would say that is exactly what the problem is. And others will also question what's the need in proliferating more laws. For example, the House of Representatives is proposing a special court for rape cases. I know the last time you were here, we talked about something like that. But if you look at how tri trials have gone uh, from the last time you were here till now and the declaration of a state of emergency on the issue, do you support the creation of special courts? I know there's the issue of the family courts, but mm. is that different from the establishment of special courts as proposed by the House? Well, the family courts would be one of the special courts that would exist, you know, to see to the speedy dispens uh, dispensation of um, um, related matters. What, one thing that we notice, and a very good um, practical example to give, is the fact that during the elections and after the election, more more of the courts seem to be election, uh, interested in election tribunals. So if it wasn't an election tribunal related case, your case was going to suffer. And so 
cases of sexual and gender-based violence seemingly took the backbench, except in cases where lives were lost or the cases went viral. And we don't need that happening. So it makes a strong case for special courts to be, um, to be dedicated to, to such matters. But what now, where, do, where now do we draw the strength of the courts? Are we trying to say that, okay, so once you're dedicated to being in the special courts, you cannot take election tribunal cases, you know, the judiciary needs to sort itself out I think, out that, I think that's field. what uh, special courts suggest. Yes. That's, that's what we hope. We hope to have dedicated hands, you know, handle these issues. In the Nigerian police, for instance, you know, we have the issue of when people are trained, to, uh, to train in victim sensitive pro uh, protocols or response, you know, after a bit, they're moved to other departments. And so we keep on having the issues of inconsistency and it rubs off negatively on the victims. So we look forward to having dedicated systems uh, which are dedicated at uh, punishing perpetrators and supporting victims. In your interaction with the police, does it suggest that they're making as much progress as you expect? Because I know that I think sometime in June, the Nigeria police swung into a, uh, action after the following the, the death of uh, Vera. And um, I think it, it, it strengthened the investigative capabilities of the gender desk and the juvenile welfare centers. Mm -hmm. How much progress? have you observed from this? So from the hierarchy of the police, I see a lot of willpower, I see a lot of will. But from the ranks and files, you know, the people who actually do the execution, the day-to-day -day implementation of these things, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, a whole lot of work that needs to be done. It's like, the, uh, you know, they're pretty much oblivious of what is happening at the top. So the same, when you say um, a, lot of, a lot was done after Uwa, you know, was murdered, the next question I would ask is, but that was the same case where money was demanded f before reports was made and, you know, and all those kind of things. We need to have standard operational procedures or practices you know, that the police engages in treating sexual and gender-based violence. First of all, it must be treated as an emergency all the time. During this COVID-19, we saw the police in many situations treats um, sexual and gender-based violence as family matter. And that's something that needs to be stopped. At the, hi at the top, you know, at the hierarchy, we saw a lot of um, willingness to treat those things as crimes, but we don't need to get to the top before we start seeing things being treated as crime. We need everybody to behave like those at the top are behaving. That's what we need. The, post, the people at the police outposts, the people at the divisions, the people at the area commands, we need them to behave like those at the top, those at the headquarters are behaving. Let's go to the sexual harassment bill now passed by the Senate. Uh, it's been widely commended by Nigerians. And for many people, they think that this will go a long way in um, addressing sexual harassment in tertiary uh, institutions. institutions. But you attended that public hearing. You've, I don't know if you've had the opportunity to go through the bill. It's a bulky article, but um, I'm sure you've had, you've understood, you've got to hear about some of the details of the bill. Is it what you expected? As far as I'm concerned, that bill is soft landing for sexual predators, you know, in the universities. That's soft landing because um, I would hope that I, I wish they would be able to get the maximum penalties that are prescribed for in the you know in the by the VAP Act, the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act. But fine, um, some progress is you know every progress is some progress. So let us progress. You know, um, for me, I was part of the lobbying for that because. In so many places, the VAP hasn't been domesticated. And then the one thing that did was it, it, it looked at specifics within the university environment. And so for us, in the absence of um, proper sexual harassment policies, if we have such a law, perhaps it could suffice. And so any, any progress, some progress is, you know, every progress is some progress. And so to that extent, I support the bill. Um, the next thing is I'm hoping that more and more would have increased convictions because the dynamics to these things now are enormous. We had a conviction that um, um, we got the powers from the ICPC Act, which looked at abuse of office. 
and all those other things. But now there are clear definitions. Since a lot of institutions have smartly decided not to get proper sexual harassment policies, or their sexual harassment policies have shifted the blame to women's dressing, so now we have something to work with. It's fair. Let's give it all, a try. all right, let's look at the details of the bill now. One of the objectives of that bill is to criminalize the act of neglect or failure of administrative heads of tertiary educational institutions to address complaints of sexual harassment within a specific period mm. of time. What does that do? It has been a huge problem. That has been a huge problem. We have had so many cases. If we look at um, the um, um, Sex for Grades documentary by Kiki Modi, for instance, you know, it took a long period be before that documentary became public knowledge and a lot of engagements with the university authorities had happened. And it's not a case in isolation. So it tells us that it's an endemic problem. And I'm happy that now we've been able to find a means. Like I said earlier, since the um, institutions smartly found a way of not having appropriate sexual harassment policies, this would now make them duty bound to do the proper things which are supposed to be done or provided for in proper sexual harassment policies. So we hope to see more institutions brought to book. We hope that more students will latch onto this to bring to book is erring institutions. Very, very important. But if we look at the provisions of that bill as far as administrative heads of tertiary institutions mm. responding to um, these um, complaints is concerned, it makes provision for a panel to be set up by the institution. Yes. And that panel should be made up of academic staff, union members, non-academic staff, union members, mm -hmm. and some students. But some would say that while it sounds like a well-constituted panel, that um, most of the panelists, uh, the, from the part of the students, people who would make that panel would be members of the student union for proper yes. representation. But we cannot deny the possibility of students uh, being in good terms or uh, with um, the Those lecturers or, you know, you know, student union members are, mm -hmm. are practically referred to as student politicians. Yes. So they might want to protect their end. How do you see this play now? I would not want to, I would not want to, I, I, I'm, I'm not a pessimist here. I'm very optimistic. Let's see what happens. Let's see what the constitutions will be of the different panels. And then let us identify the problems. Then we can tackle the problems head on. You know, um, I understand the fears. The fears are very valid, especially being that we are Nigerians. Nonetheless, let's not preempt these things. Let's have these things work out so that if we are saying this thing did not work out right or this thing does not work out right, we have examples. You know, we talked about something and I gave you examples. So let's just have people give us examples that we can take on and... The, 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 there's also the clause that says uh, that seeks to remove mutual consent as a defense in the prosecution of sexual harassment cases in mm -hmm. these schools. But what this basically means is a lecturer cannot say that the, ch the student gave consent. Yes. So um, I think the Senate Deputy President of the Senate in his argument said we should take out that and make it appear as though every student in a tertiary institution should cannot. be referred to as a minor yes. so they cannot give consent. Does that work? Yes. Because the um, sexual abuse is all about power, 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 and more power. That thing about it was mu it's, uh, there was mutual consent. We found out that that's a safe space for predators. And w as far as I'm concerned, it is sextortion. It is extorting sex until you take out the power dynamics that favor the lecturers or that favor people who are in authority or who are in a position to. Um, um, to deny students of whatever they can get, then you will not have equal playing field. So it makes a lot of sense. So this extends to ensuring to the other portion of the, um, the law that says, of this bill actually that says that they should maintain a fiduciary relationship. You cannot date your lecturer. A lecturer cannot date for a student. Safety. Or wait for them to graduate. It's the, it doesn't take eternity. You, you wait for them to graduate. Yeah. If you love so much, then you wait for the person to graduate. All right, let's take a quick break and we'll be right back. Stay with us. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back to Hard Copy. My guest is Dorothy Njemanze. She's an activist and an advocate against rape and gender-based violence. Dorothy, we were speaking about the sexual harassment bill of the uh, Senate, which was passed on Tuesday, just before we went, went on that break. And there were some arguments on the floor of the Senate. One of them sought to protect lawmakers and um, lecturers against um, 
false accusation. Mm. Where for many people, you cannot deny the possibility of students weaponizing this bill and using it to falsely accuse lecturers. Now, some people have said there are arguments that are of um, sexual harassment against lecturers by the students. Mm -hmm. How do you compare or how do you weigh sexual harassment against lecturers by the students and false accusation? What place do, do those things have in this bill? There have always been laws existent before the sexual harassment, um, uh, the sexual harassment law came to being. When somebody falsely accuses you of something, there are legal means to seeking um, redress. So by all means, the lecturers should do so. The, the lecturers, I think that the people who have something to be scared of are people who have a history of abuse. Otherwise, why would suddenly um, evidence against you emerge? If somebody, I've always been the advocate for um, strong systems so that irrespective of whoever alleges, the systems can fish out who is telling the truth. I'm always an advocate of systems to um, um, protect and support victims and then punish perpetrators. Now, it's possible that a perpetrator could report a case. It's possible that a victim could report a case. And there could be different dynamics to it. But what systems do we have in place? If we don't have strong systems, we will not be able to get to the truth. And the truth is relative. So, but what systems do we have in place? Whatever the report that is made, if I come up with evidence that you're requesting for certain things or you're trying to force me to go to have lunch with you and I don't want to have lunch with you and you're telling me, oh, I'm not going to make it past you know, uh, first semester because I don't want to have lunch with you, then that's harassment. So there's always a means of proving these things. Let's stop making it look like it's rocket science. What is the story? What are the facts of the matter? It's easy to deduce where the truth is and where the lie is. Is it possible that a lecturer can be um, harassed? Yes, it is. When it is, the lecturer has legal options of what to do. Okay, you mentioned that um, lecturers who have nothing to hide should not be afraid of this bill. Of and it's course. interesting you say that because ASU's presentation uh, during the public hearing of this bill was quite clear. They do not want this bill passed. In clear terms, <laughs> they say this is victimization oh. of, the, uh, of the lecturers. Now, according to them, they say that the bill violates all known global norms and legal principles in the sense that universities and other tertiary institutions have their own mechanisms to deal with things like this. They, mm. say they refer to universities as autonomous bodies mm. and they say that the uh, Universities Act of 2003 empowers the universities to hand regulate their own affairs, including misconduct among staff and students. Yeah. Does that argument stand? So, if whatever the ASU is referring to was so effective, there wouldn't be need in the first instance to see what we could do to curb sexual harassment of students. There wouldn't be need. Um, We've had so many, so many, so many cases. And w I have particularly been part of cases where ASU was written to. Till date, years after, we never got any replies. And so as an institution or as a body, ASU has relatively been irresponsible. We have taken the um, laws into our hands and, you know, we've taken it into our hands and we've engaged our... Uh, uh, legislators with the power we have, having employed them to hold important offices in trust for us. And we have gotten them and they've, done, they've seen our cries and they've done the needful. So let's, 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 let's see how it works. Um, I don't think, you see, students are emotional beings with human rights. It's about time lecturers understood that and lecturers respected that. If this is what it is going to take for lecturers to respect the rights of students, so be it. Anybody who doesn't have, uh, who is not a sexual predator has no fears. So ASU is also arguing that this law is targeted at uh, a group of persons or an individual which violates the cardinal principle of law. So it's targeted in, at, uh, in this case, educators. We've had, re we've had reason to see educators exploit students who were kept in their custody. And we're only trying to protect the human rights and the dignity of the people who are kept in custody of anybody under the guise of education. There is reason for concern, and the reason for concern has birthed this. By all means, 
everybody in ASU should respect the fact that students are emotional beings with human rights and work with the students to ensure that nobody's rights is violated. As long as you're not violating anybody's rights, you're not going to be looking back. You're not going to be checking on who has caught you or who's not caught you. Um, there's so many cases. Do we talk about what happened in OAU? Do we talk about the different ones from uh, Benin City? Do we talk about the Unilag cases? Do, there's so many so of them. Asso's argument now is beyond just being targeted at a person or a group of persons mm -hmm. which violates the cardinal uh, principles of law, that it also leaves out sexual harassment in primary schools, secondary schools, <laughs> and possibly workplaces. And this now raises the question, mm -hmm. do we now need to enact specific laws like for this, each of these elsewhere. institutions? Well, this um, law was, you know, being, uh, what well, the consult consultations around this law, these were some of the concerns that I had personally. Nonetheless, if this is where we could start from, let us start from here. We have laws that could have taken care of these things. Remember, I started out by saying that as far as I was concerned, this law is soft landing for sexual predators that are in the field, you, you know, in the university system. Why? Because it predicts five to 14 years. Yes, but 14 years would be the minimum for Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act. We'll be going for life sentence with the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act. So as far as I'm concerned, this is soft landing. So let's start from saying how this works. But then there's the problem of domestication, as you rightly pointed out in yeah. the beginning. So yeah. does this not suffice in that case? Well, for what it's worth, I've always been a firm believer in legal frameworks. I'm one person who latched onto the legal framework of the Maputo Protocol and it's, you know, earned the landmark judgment in the Dorothy Germanze and three others versus the Federal Republic of Nigeria. So legal framework has, you know, been uh, given to helpless students. Let's see what they make of it. And while we're seeing what they make of it, we'd also see, you know, what can be done to improve it or what can be done to extend the powers to other people but is there a need has there been a need to look at what happens in the university spaces mm -hmm. in the tertiary institution spaces absolutely yes there has been a need do you think that we should have a register as well for sexual harassment uh perpetrators of sexual harassment just as we have for the uh rape offenders all sex offenders should make it to the sex, uh, the sex offenders register, irrespective of what, what, what law you're convicted with. You know, all sex offenders should make it to the sex offenders register. So all offenders, all sex offenders from this uh, new law should make it to the sex offenders register. By all means, our own is to look for all the loopholes that sex offenders have been escaping from, plug all of them so that by, you know, we, we, their names still make it to the sex offenders register. And on that note, I'm happy with this. Well, just before we go, I know you've been following up on um, the case with Vera Omozua. Yes. God bless her soul. Uh, what's the update on that? Much as it's been said that um, the um, Nigerian police in Abuja is handling the case, you see, the, the operational gaps that I talk about, it means that somebody has to bear the cost of the family to make appearances in Abuja and every relevant person to make appearances in Abuja. My question now is how do we improve the capacity of the police so that irrespective of where it is, the burden is not on the victims. The burden is not on the victims. It's bad enough that victims have gone through whatever it is or have suffered loss. We should stop pushing. Is that the case now? It's still happening. I mean, is that the case with the family now? Are they unable to follow up? Whether they are or not, I'm, I'm talking as somebody who has had cause to bring people from other states to Abuja for a case. No, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying for us to be specific because yes. um, that case opened up a can of worms. So I'm aware that the case opened up a can of worms, but the thing about it is usually when there's a need f to bring a case from one location to Abuja, most of the time, majority of the time I, I you I, I seldom know of any cases that the police foot the bills you know it's usually the um, well, should it be the police footing the bills oh yes the government what is the duty how independence so in of the police case, the government yes not the, the, po police. the police represents the government Very remember well, that then. when I approach I approached the echo was court the ineptitude of the um, state actors were seen as the ineptitude of the government mm -hmm. so the police represents the government here Dorothy uh, I thank you so much for your time and uh, you. keep up the good work you're doing. Dorothy Njemanze is an activist and uh, an advocate. She's the founder of the Dorothy Njemanze Foundation.
Well, that's the program tonight, but we want to hear from you. What are your thoughts on the steps taken so far by the federal government and the government of your state? Are you satisfied? Where do you want more work done? Well, speak to us using the handles on your screen. And remember, you can follow up on this conversation and all the episodes via our podcasts. Simply go to channelstv.com forward slash podcasts. Thanks for watching. I'm Terry Ikumi. Goodbye.